This month, for, for you, we are doing A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking by T. Kingfisher. T. Kingfisher is also known as Ursula, Ursula K. Vernon. Ursula is a friend of ours and a just ridiculously prolific author whose husband has just acquired several new kittens. Uh, they are deeply lovely, profoundly odd people. And this is a deeply lovely and profoundly odd story, which I promise you is nothing of the sort like Search and Rescue. This is a very definite plan from us to, uh, you know, ensure that you have something perhaps a little nicer to play with after the last few weeks. I see some people uh, in the chat have, are, are aware of the, the, the magic of... Kevin, the world's most metal Disney princess. This pleases me immensely. He is. He is a biker <laughs> Disney princess. That is how you describe Kevin. He is, if you've ever seen old school... Tom and Jerry. No, is it Tom and Jerry? With the big bulldog. So it is Mark Antony is the name of the big bulldog. And um, Pussyfoot is the name of the kitten. That is Kevin. And there's even fan art of Kevin as Mark Antony with a little Pussyfoot kitten. It's adorable. Happy birthday for yesterday, Haven. I'm so glad you spent the day with your kitten chasing balloons around the room. That sounds amazing. I'm so jealous. <laughs> Honey, we need pets. We really do. Uh, all stories are true. All of them. Especially this one. So, real quick, get comfy. Uh, get some water. Eat a food. Take some drugs it, that you need if you need to take some drugs. Check down on pets and such. Uh, check in on pets and such. I can assure you the bedroom door is closed, so there will be no suave catboy lumberjack hours here tonight. Thank you. And we'll kick off. I messed up your place in the book, haven't I? Because I was reading ahead. That's why I'm reading on a different device. <laughs> Checkmate. Uh -huh. A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking. By T. Kingfisher. There was a dead girl in my aunt's bakery. I let out an undignified yelp and backed up a step and then another until I ran into the bakery door. We keep the door open most of the time because the big ovens get swelteringly hot otherwise, but it was four in the morning and nothing was warmed up yet. I could tell right away that she was dead. I haven't seen a lot of dead bodies in my life. I'm only 14. Baking's not exactly a high mortality profession. But the red stuff oozing out from under her head definitely wasn't raspberry filling. And she was lying at an awkward angle that nobody would choose to sleep in, even assuming they'd break into a bakery to take a nap in the first place. My stomach made an awful clenching like somebody had grabbed it and squeezed it hard, and I clapped both hands over my mouth to keep from getting sick. It was already enough of a mess to clean up without adding my second-hand breakfast to it. The worst thing I've ever seen in the kitchen was the occasional rat. Don't judge us, you can't keep rats out in this city. And we're as clean an establishment as you'll ever find. And the zombie frog. The one that crawled out of the canals. Poor thing had been downstream of the cathedral. And sometimes they dumped the holy water a little recklessly. And, well, you get a plague of undead frogs and newts and whatnot. The crawfish are the worst. You can get the frogs with a broom, but you have to call in a priest for a zombie crawfish. But I would have preferred any number of zombie frogs to a corpse. I have to get Aunt Tabitha. She'll know what to do. Not that Aunt Tabitha had bodies in her bakery on a regular basis, but she's one of those competent people who always knows what to do. If a herd of ravenous centaurs descended on the city and went galloping through the streets, devouring small children and cats, Aunt Tabitha would calmly go about setting up barricades and manning crossbows, as if she did it twice a week. Unfortunately, to get to the hallway that led to the stairs, up to Aunt Tabitha's bedroom, I would have to walk the length of the kitchen, and that meant walking past the corpse. Stepping over it, in fact. Okay. Okay. Feet. You with me? Knees? Can we do this? The feet and knees reported their willingness. The stomach was not happy with this plan at all. I wrapped one hand around my waist, climbed the other firmly over my mouth in case it decided to rebel. Okay. Okay, here, here, here we go. I inched into the kitchen. I spent six days a week here, sometimes seven, running back and forth across the tile, flinging dough onto counters and pans into ovens. 
I crossed the kitchen floor hundreds of times a day without even thinking about it. Now, it seemed to be about a mile long, an unfamiliar and a hostile landscape. I had a dilemma. I didn't want to look at the body, but if I didn't, I might step on it, on her, and that just didn't bear thinking about. No, no help for it. I looked down. The dead girl's legs were splayed across the floor. She was wearing grimy boots with mismatched socks, and that seemed really sad. I mean, it was sad that she was dead anyway, probably, unless she'd been a horrible person, but dying with mismatched socks seemed especially sad somehow. I imagined her throwing the socks on, never thinking that a few hours later an apprentice baker and half-baked wizard of dough would be tiptoeing past her and thinking about the condition of her footwear. There was probably a moral there somewhere, but I'm not a priest. Thought about becoming one once, but they don't really like wizards, even minor wizards, whose only talents are making bread rise and keeping the pastry dough from sticking together. Right about the time I gave up on the hopes of joining the priesthood, Aunt Tabitha had taken me on in the bakery, and the siren song of flour and shortening pretty much sealed my fate. I wondered what had sealed this poor girl's fate. Her hair was mostly over her face, so it was hard to tell how old she was. And I wasn't looking very closely. But I got the feeling she was young. Maybe not much older than me. How did she wind up dead in our bakery? Somebody who was cold or hungry might conceivably creep into the bakery. It's warm, even at night, since we bank the big stoves, but we don't put them out. And there's always food around, even just the day-old stuff in the case. But that didn't explain why she was dead. I could see one of her eyes. It was open. I looked away again. Maybe she slipped and hit her head. Aunt Tabitha always swears I'll break my neck one of these days, the way I race around the kitchen like a flower-crazed greyhound. But it seems weird that you break into a bakery and then run around inside it. Maybe she was murdered whispered a traitorous little voice in my brain. Shut up! Shut up! That's that's just stupid, I told it. People hold murders in back alleys and things, not my aunt's kitchen. And it'd be stupid to leave a body in a bakery. The whole city is built on canals. There are 50 bridges to a street, and the basements flood every spring. Who'd dump a body in a bakery where you could dump it in a perfectly good canal, not 20 feet from the door? I held my breath and stepped over the dead girl's ankles. Nothing happened. I wasn't expecting anything to happen, but I was still relieved. I looked straight ahead, took two more careful steps, then broke into a run. I knocked the door open with my shoulder and tore up the stairs yelling, Aunt Tabitha! Come quick! It was four in the morning, but bakers are used to getting up at four in the morning, and the only reason that Aunt Tabitha was sleeping until the decadent hour of 6.30 was because her niece had been finally trusted to open the bakery in the last few months. That's me, in case you aren't following along. She'd been nervous about letting me take over, and I'd been really proud that nothing had gone wrong when I was opening. This made me feel twice as guilty that a dead body had turned up on my watch, even though it wasn't my fault. I mean, it's not like I had killed her. Don't be stupid. Nobody killed her. She just slipped. Probably. Aunt Tabitha! Gracious, Mona! muttered my aunt from behind the door. Is the building on fire? No, Aunt Tabitha, I have discovered a dead body in our kitchen, was what I meant to say. What came out was something more along the lines of, Aunt Body, there's a Tabitha, the kitchen, dead, she's dead, I, I come quick, she's dead. The door at the top of the stairs was flung open, and my aunt emerged, shouldering into her house dress. Her house dress is large. Her house dress is pink. Her house dress has winged croissants embroidered across it. It is quite hideous. Aunt Tabitha herself is large and pink, but doesn't have winged croissants flying across her, except when she is wearing her house dress. Dead, she narrowed her, her eyes down at me. Who's dead? The body in the kitchen. In my kitchen? 
On Tabitha came barreling down the stairs at top speed, and not wanting to be trampled, I retreated in front of her. She brushed me aside, not unkindly, and went sideways through the door to the bakery. I followed, poking my head timidly round the door frame, and waiting for the explosion. Ah, Aunt Tabitha put a fist on each generous hip. That's a dead body, all right. Lord save us. There was a long silence. I stared at her back, and she stared at the dead girl, and the dead girl stared at the ceiling. Um, Aunt Tabitha, what should we do? I finally asked. Aunt Tabitha shook herself. Well, I'll go wake your uncle up and send him around to the constables. You start lighting the fires and put a tray of sweet buns on. Sweet buns? We're going to bake. We're a bakery girl, my aunt snapped. Besides, never knew a copper who didn't love a sweet bun and will be swarming with them before long. Better put on two trays. There's a dear. Um, I drew myself together. Should I start the rest of the baking then? My aunt frowned and tugged at her lower lip. No. No, I don't think so. They'll be in and out and making a mess of things for a few hours at least. We'll just have to open later, I suppose. She turned and stalked heavily away to roust my uncle. I was left alone with the dead girl and the ovens. I could get to one of the ovens easily enough, and I poked up the fire underneath and threw another log on. There's this trick to keeping the ovens heated evenly, and it's the first thing you learn. If you have spots that are too hot or too cold, your bread gets full in spots and comes out lumpy and looking sort of squashed in places. I couldn't reach the other oven without stepping over her. After a moment's thought, I threw one of our dish towels over her face. It was easier, somehow, if I couldn't see that one eye staring upward at nothing. I fired up the other oven. Sweet buns are easy. I could make sweet buns in my sleep, and occasionally at four in the morning, I pretty much do. I threw the dry ingredients together in a bowl and started whisking them together. I gazed up at the rafters so that I didn't have any chance of seeing the body. There was a brief shine of eyes as a mouse looked down at me, then scurried across the rafters on his way back to his mouse hole. Having a ma By the way, having mice is actually a good thing, since it means we don't have rats anymore. Rats think mice are yummy. There were eggs on the counter and a big crockery jar of shortening in the corner. I cracked the eggs, separated out the yolks, perfectly, I might add, and dumped all the ingredients into a bigger bowl and started beating. I heard the front door open. I heard the front door close. Uncle Albert went out to get the constable. Aunt Tabitha was bustling around the front of the shop, probably getting ready to turn the first wave of customers away. I wondered how many constables we'd get. A couple, right? For a murder. Murders are important. Oh, would the body wagon come? Well, it'd have to, wouldn't it? We couldn't very well just set the body out with the garbage. The wagon would come, and then all the neighbours would think my uncle had died. Nobody would think Tabitha had died, of course. She was a force of nature. And they'd come around gossiping, and they'd find out there had been a murder, and... Wait, when did I decide it was a murder? She just slipped. I discovered that between not looking at the dead girl and wondering about constables, that I had been kneading the sweet bun dough for much too long. Here's the thing. You don't want to knead them too much, or it makes them tough. I stuck a flowery hand in the dough and suggested that maybe it didn't want to be so tough. There was a sort of fizziness around my fingers and the dough went a little stickier. Now, dough is really amicable to persuasion if you know how to ask it right. Sometimes I forget that other people can't. I separated out a dozen evenly sized lumps of raw dough and set them on the wooden baking panel. Then shoved them into the oven with strict orders that they didn't want to burn. They wouldn't. Not burning is one of the few magics I'm really good at. Once, when I was having a really awful day, I did it too hard, and half the bread didn't bake at all. <laughs> Jax, I'm sorry! <laughs> Jax has just put in the... Did Marguerite write this? <laughs> did Marguerite write this? I wish I wrote this well. Oh, sorry, do you know helps. That was the sweet buns done. I wiped my hands on my apron and dipped a cup of flour out of one of the bins. 
there was one other task that had to be done no matter what whether there was one body in the kitchen or a dozen the steps down to the basement are slippery because everybody's basements leak it's amazing we still have them my father who was a builder before he died he used to say that it was because there was another city down there and people just kept on building upwards as the canals rose so the basement floors were really the roofs and ceilings of old houses in the darkest warmest corner of the basement a bucket bubbled slowly every now and then one of the bubbles would pop and exhale a damp yeasty aroma come on bob i said using the sugary tones you'd use to approach an unpredictable animal come on i've got some nice flour for you bob popped several bubbles which is bob's version of an enthusiastic greeting bob is my sourdough starter he's the first big magic i ever did and i didn't know what i was doing so i overdid it a sourdough starter is kind of a gloppy mess of all the yeast and weird little growing things that you need to make bread rise. The taste of the bread can change a lot depending on the starter. Most of them live for a couple of weeks, but in the right hands they can stay alive for years. There's one in Constantine that's supposed to be over a century old. Now, when I first started working in my aunt's bakery, I was just 10 and I was so scared that I would screw something up. My magic did weird things to recipes sometimes. So, I was put in charge of tending her sourdough starter, which she'd been using since she started the bakery, and which was really important because Aunt Tabitha's bread was famous. And I don't know if I gave it too much flour or too much water, or not enough of either, but it dried up and it nearly died. And when I found that out, I was so scared that I stuck both hands into it, and it was pretty icky, let me tell you, and ordered it not to die, to live. I told it, come on, don't die on me, live, grow, eat, please don't dry up. Well, I was 10, and I was really scared. And sometimes being scared does weird things to the magic. Supercharges it, for one thing. The starter didn't die. It grew. A lot. It foamed out of the jar and over my hands, and I started yelling for Aunt Tabitha, but by the time she got there, the starter had reached the sack of flour I'd been using to feed it and ate the whole thing. I started crying, but Aunt Tabitha just put her hands on her hips and said, It's still alive. It'll be fine and scraped it into a much bigger jar, and that was the beginning of Bob. I'm not actually sure if we could kill him anymore. One time the city froze so hard nobody could go anywhere, and Aunt Tabitha was stuck across town for three days, and I couldn't get down the block, and nobody fed Bob. I expected to come back and find him frozen, or starved, or something. Instead, the bucket had moved across the basement, and there were the remains of a couple of rats scattered around. He hadn't eaten the bones. That was how we figured out that Bob could feed himself. I'm still not sure how he moves. Like a slime mold, maybe. I'm not going to pick the bucket up and find out. I doubt there's a bottom on it anymore. And I don't want to risk annoying, I don't want to risk annoying Bob. He likes me best, because I feed him the most often. He tolerates Aunt Tabitha. My uncle won't go into the basement anymore. He claims Bob actually hissed at him once. It would have been kind of a belching hiss, I imagine. I dumped the flower in on top of Bob and he glubbed happily in his bucket and extended a sort of mushy tentacle. I pulled it off and the starter settled back and began digesting the flour. He doesn't seem to mind me taking bits to make bread and it's still the best sourdough in town. We just don't tell anybody about the eating rats thing. Chapter 2 Constable Alphonse was tall and broad and red-faced. He came into the kitchen, stopped, and said, sounding surprised, There's a dead body in here. That's what I told you, said Uncle Albert behind him, sounding aggrieved. Well, yeah, but the constable trailed off, but still made it abundantly clear that he'd expected a hysterical member of the public to be getting upset about nothing, not that there would be a genuine dead body in a respectable bakery. 
Aunt Tabitha took charge. It's a dead body, all right? Mona found it this morning when she came in. Have a sweet bun. Constable Alphonse took a sweet bun, chewed, and decided to go for a second opinion. Constable Montgomery was also tall, also broad, but instead of being red-faced, was rather sallow. He ate three sweet buns, confirmed that, yes, indeed, it was a dead body, and then he and Alphonse stood in the kitchen in silence until Aunt Tabitha testily suggested that maybe they should call for the body wagon. We'll need the coroner said Montgomery, and helped himself to another sweet bun. Coroner, yeah, agreed Alphonse. They went out. Better put in another tray of sweet buns, said Aunt Tabitha, and a pot of tea, I think. Looks like we'll be all morning about this. The coroner, when he arrived, was a short man, bald and slabby, like a half-melted candle. He ate most of a tray of sweet buns by himself, but I didn't get to hear what he said, because once they started moving the body, Aunt Tabitha shooed me out to the front of the store to take care of customers. Most of the customers are regulars, and they have regular orders, and while they were disappointed that their muffins and breads and scones weren't available, they were more worried that something was wrong. I repeated over and over again that everything was fine, somebody had just broken into the kitchen and the police were looking at, into it, but nothing seemed to have been stolen, and we were hoping to be open for business later today. Nobody's safe anymore, said old Mrs. McGrammer, one lemon scone, no icing, with a sniff. She wrapped a cane against the counter for emphasis. Imagine, someone's breaking into a bakery. We'll all be murdered in our beds soon, and no mistake. Some of us sooner than others, muttered Mr. Elwich, the foot carpenter, two cinnamon rolls, one loaf of cheese bread, winking at me. Humph! Miss McGrammer shook her cane at him. You can laugh, wee Sydney, the boy of Mrs. Weatherfoot, who does the washing. He went missing just last week. Never seen hide nor hair of him since. No, I ventured. They have not. She smacked her cane down like a judge's gavel. Probably ran away to sea, offered Brutus the Chandler. One of wh whatever looks good today, my dear, and a loaf of the day old for the pigeons if you have it. Ran away to sea, asked Miss McGrammer, scandalised. Elwidge put a hand over his mouth to stifle a smile. Sydney, doing nothing doing. He was a good boy, he was. Even good boys will be boys, said Brutus mildly, rubbing his forearms. He had several faded tattoos, and I suspect he was speaking from personal experience. Sydney Weatherford wouldn't run away to sea, piped up the tiny widow Holloway. One blackberry muffin, two ginger cookies, and thank you so much, dear Mona. You're getting to look more like your poor dear mother every day, you know. He was a magicker, and you know how superstitious sailors are about taking on wizard folk. They think the winds will fail if you're carrying wizard folk abroad. Magicker? Elwidge looked surprised. I didn't know that. He was a mender, said the widow Holloway. Little things. He fixed my glasses for me once when the lens cracked, and I thought I'd have to send away to Constantine to have a new one grind. She smiled at me. Small things, though. Nothing like as good as our Mona here. I flushed. As wizards go, I'm pretty much the bottom of the barrel. Even Master Elwidge, who's got just enough magic to take knots out of wooden boards, is better than me. Dough and pastries are about all I can do. The great wizards, the magi, the ones that serve the Duchess, they can throw fireballs around or rip mountains out of the earth, heal the dying, turn lead into gold. <sighs> me, I turn flour into yeast, and me, I, turn, can, I can turn flour and yeast into tasty bread on a good day, and occasionally make carnivorous sourdough starters. Still, they were all looking at me expectantly, and I didn't have any food for them, so I felt like I ought to do something. I reached into the case and pulled out one of the day-old gingerbread men. It's early spring, and much too late to still be carrying gingerbread men, but we're the one bakery that stocks a few all year round, just for this purpose. I set the gingerbread man on the counter and focused my attention on it. Live! Move! Up! 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 The cookie woke up. It stretched its arms and pushed itself up onto its gingerbread feet. Then it bowed to the widow Holloway and to Miss McGrammer, through a salute to Elwidge and Brutus, and walked along the counter until it came to a clear space. Dance, 
I ordered it. The gingerbread man began to dance a very respectable hornpipe. Don't ask me where the cookies get the dances they do. This batch had been doing hornpipes. The last batch did waltzes, and the one before that had performed a decidedly lewd little number that had made even Aunt Tabitha blush. A little bit too much spice in those, I think. We had to add a lot of vanilla to settle them down. I don't know how I learned to do it. I don't know how I learned to make cookies dance. Apparently I used to do it when I was very, very young. Aunt Tabitha still loves to tell the story of the time I was three and threw a tantrum in the bakery and the entire case of gingerbread men came alive, even the ones that were still in the oven. They started hammering on the door to be let out and the already baked ones ran through the store, giggling like little maniacs. They go into the mouse holes, she always says. It took us months to see the end of the little devils. That's when I knew, I knew our Mona was going to be a baker. Depending on how much she's got into the kitchen sherry at that point, I get either an affectionate glance or a flowery pat on the back. During rum cake season, there is hugging. Being a wizard is almost all like that. You don't know what you can do until you actually do it, and then sometimes you aren't sure what you just did. There aren't teachers who can help you. Everybody's different. There's usually only a couple dozen magic folk in any given city anyway. A few hundred if it's a really big one. Maybe in the army the war wizards get special training. But down here it's all trial and error and a lot of wasted bread dough. Anyway, the cookies. For me, it works best with cookies that are mostly people or animal shaped. Something to do with sympathetic magic. The parish priest said, six loaves of plain bread and, oh, all right, one very scone, but don't tell the abbot. And it had to be something made of dough. The puppeteers, who put on the Punch and Judy show in the park, they could make wooden puppets dance. But I could focus on wood until I got a splitting headache and it'd just lie there. Dough is all I can do. It's not a very useful skill. But it is handy on occasion. If I can't get something at the back of a shelf, I can usually get a gingerbread man to climb up there and push it forward until I can grab it. We bake up a new batch once a week. Aunt Tabitha says that if nothing else, it's good advertising. I've heard, well, overheard, wasn't supposed to hear it, that there are some people who won't come into the bakery now that I'm here. I don't know if dancing gingerbread bothers them, or if it's the notion of a magica baking their bread. I think Aunt Tabitha lost a couple of regulars when I started working. She's never said anything about it. I figure, if they'll let a little thing like that bother them, they deserve to miss out on the best sourdough in the city. Anyway, the gingerbread man finished his hornpipe and bowed to his audience, who applauded. Even Miss McGrammer, unbent enough to smile, and she's one of those people who watches magic folk like they're about to run mad or explode into a shower of frogs. The cookie blew a kiss to the widow Holloway, who giggled as if she were a much younger woman, and then marched back to his bin. Thank you, I told it. That's enough for now. It saluted me. This batch was rather military, now that I think of it. Maybe we went heavy on the cardamom, and went back to being an ordinary cookie. Very nice, said Master Elwich. It's not much, I said, embarrassed. Better than I can do, he said, and winked at me. I know he's another magicker, but I've never seen him do anything but straighten bent wood. Still, that's got to be more useful than making cookies dance. When everyone had been shooed out of the shop, which took a while in the case of Miss McGrammer, I went back into the kitchen, just in time to be accused of murder.